In my wrestling and in my doubts In my failures you won't walk out Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, You are the peace in my troubled sea Silence, you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, You are the peace in my troubled sea My lighthouse, my lighthouse I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore. Wednesday night service. Happy to have you guys here tonight. Uh, well, here in uh, spirit, I guess, but here uh, in the, the connected service that we have going on. Hope your, your week has been going well. Um, I hope that this has been a time of, as much as it can be, a time of refreshment, a time of um, getting to have some new experiences. Uh, I had uh, one of our, our friends that we connect with online, we were talking to him and like, talking about what, what all are you guys doing uh, to get through this time, and a lot of people are saying, oh, I'm catching up on some shows I missed, oh, I'm just relaxing. He rattled off like eight different hobbies that he'd been trying out. It's like, I'm trying roller skating and woodworking and like 10 other things that he was doing. I was like, dang, he's got his beat, right? Um, but this is a really good time to, um, if you can. Um, I know a lot of people have said, if I just had the time, I'd write that book. You got the time, right? If I just had the time, I'd learn to play that instrument. You got the time now, don't you? Um, so I really, uh, I pray that this can be a time of um, re refreshment for you. And I also pray that this comes to end, an end very quickly, right? Uh, we pray uh, for the, the God of the universe to, to quickly uh, deliver and bring this to, to an end. Uh, but in all this, we, we trust God to accomplish what is, is good. 
Uh, as we continue talking about prayer requests a little bit, always want to uh, lift up the leaders that we have. Uh, I don't envy uh, anyone in the position that they're in right now. Uh, so many of them, uh, every decision that they make, uh, every misstep that they have is going to be criticized and is going to be um, viewed by everyone. So many people trying to uh, make the best decisions that they possibly can and everyone uh, ready to jump all over them for it. Uh, so we pray for them, uh, pray for protection for them, we pray for um, wisdom in their leadership, uh, we pray for, pray for righteousness to prevail uh, in, in these areas, we, we desire to see all of that. Of course, we continue to pray for um, our community, um, and I don't know about you guys, but this has been a really refreshing time of community. You would think at a time where so many of us are getting pushed apart that it wouldn't be that case, but I've seen so many people coming together and offering support and offering um, just different employers offering services to their employees and um, making these available. And I, I, I praise God for that. It's, it's been a delight. We, we continue to pray um, in that. I uh, pray for our, our families at home. Uh, again, uh, hopefully we got a lot of moms and dads that are uh, getting comfortable in their new role as teachers right at, at home now. Uh, so I pray that that's going well for you guys. Um, and for, for all of us, I pray that we can be just whatever our circumstances are, like, uh, like, like Paul says, I know how to uh, be abased and I know how to abound. And I pray that we can be a, a beacon of, of peace to the world, that when the world looks at Christianity, that they will see um, those that, that know how to find satisfaction, know how to find joy uh, in God. That's what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. Uh, one, of my, um, one of my favorite stories to, to, to share uh, about the, uh, the attitude of gratitude that we should approach God with. Uh, this this uh, story is almost a proverb in the blinking ship household. Anytime um, Lee and I wind up complaining about what we call like first world problems, we usually get into, remember the garlic, TJ? Remember the garlic? If you don't know what we're talking about, uh, you'll, you'll see what we're talking about here in a little bit in the book of Numbers. But uh, we're going to start um, with a, a word of prayer, and we're going to get into the lesson. But before that, I want to encourage you guys, uh, you can see up on our screen, uh, we have the, the splash page for our Right Now Media Study, the book of, uh, going through the book of First Peter with Kyle Eidelman. If you are not doing this study, I encourage you guys, pick it up, um, give some time to doing this. Uh, we recommend doing it on Sunday night, uh, but uh, find, find a night of the week that works for, for your family. I'm going to be a little bit honest. We've been doing it on Monday nights, and it's been wonderful for our family. Well, yeah, but it, it's been really good. Um, but yeah, find, find a night that, that works for your family and go through the study. It is a very powerful um, uh, series. Uh, Kyle's talking. First Peter is is written to a bunch of Christians, really under some severe pressure uh, by the world and the circumstances that they're in, and being talked to on on how to survive and thrive in a world that doesn't want them to. Um, and even though the circumstances that we're going through were very different than what they're going through, uh, a lot of the the same character principles apply. So I really want to encourage you uh, take the time to dive into that study. Again, if 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 family Bible study, a family um, devotion. Is, is not currently a part of, of your family's normal routine, no better time to, to start doing that than, than now. Uh, I pray that um, this resource will help you grow in that. Jamie. TJ, the um, study in First Peter did some memory work back a number of years ago in it, and Peter opens up addressing that to strangers scattered mm. and trying to understand um, there was both Jew and Gentiles that he church members, saved church members, but probably some of those came from Jerusalem, mm. and probably Peter knew them personally, because mm. they were members of the church at Jerusalem, and then as a result of Saul's persecution, Acts chapter 8, those families had been there for generations, mm. and they, they had their shops, and they were middle income people, and so as far as people, you know, they've been laid off right now because of this uh, epidemic, pandemic that we're in, um, there, there might be some association mm -hmm. uh, there how to, how to deal with that because a lot of these people have been displaced. They had to leave Jerusalem, had to leave the place their generation, their families lived for generations and the business that they had and go to another part of the world and try to get reestablished. Yes, sir. 
And uh, of course, that was uh, Brother Jamie on, uh, on the microphone here tonight. Uh, but uh, we, uh, you might have picked up on the fact that now our audience, since our audience has microphone again, uh, there's going to be another discussion lesson. Uh, always enjoy having these discussions if we can. Um, so if you happen to be on, um, give Miss Lorraine the hard job again, but if you happen to be on Miss Lorraine's Facebook Live, if you have any questions that you want to chime in with, I'm sure uh, she'll be happy to be a mouthpiece for you guys, or uh, any insight or comments, I'm sure she'll be happy to be a mouthpiece uh, for, for you guys. And I encourage you, weigh in. I want, uh, tonight is going to be very much uh, a discussion feel to it, so um, please participate at home. Very much a devotional feel. Uh, I hope that tonight be a solid night for, for introspection. Uh, but with that, let's go to God in a word of prayer, and then we're going to be in the book of Numbers. Okay. God, we come before you tonight, and uh, once again, just express our gratitude, Lord. Uh, there are a lot of inconveniences that we can fo focus on, Lord, uh, but boy, are, are we filled with still a flood of conveniences, Lord. Um, we, we, for, for the time of quote-unquote scarcity that we go th through, that we're going through right now, we still go to, go to grocery stores that are filled with food. Um, we still have uh, all the amenities and utilities and uh, electric and power and air and um, internet and all these like uh, available to us. Uh, we still have the ability to, to reach out um, to, to one another, uh, even to, to host these services remotely and just to grow in your word uh, remotely. And, and so God, we're, we're grateful for that. Um, God, we do pray and we desire um, God, uh, our, our heart would be uh, the quicker that this could be over, the better. Uh, I know uh, a lot of us are looking forward to getting back to our jobs, looking forward to um, getting back to the quote-unquote normalcy of life. Uh, but I pray that this will be a time of growth for us. God, teach us what you would have us to learn. Grow us the way that you would have us to grow. Uh, shape us in, uh, more into the image of Christ through uh, the, this, this, this period, Lord. Um, God, help us to, uh, in this time, um, be a, a demonstration to the world of the grace and the comfort that, that you give us. Uh, God, when the, the world looks at us, I pray that they would know uh, for certain that our, our citizenship is not of this earth, but our citizenship belongs in the kingdom of God, and it's there that we find our security, Lord. God, we want to pray over our rulers. We want to pray over our leaders. Uh, all the way from um, city officials, county officials, state officials, government, uh, federal government, uh, even those that are making um, decisions that uh, in some way affect the whole world right now. Uh, God, we, we pray over them. Uh, God, we would pray that righteousness would flourish. Um, God, so much so uh, we, we pray that. We know that there are people uh, looking to use the, these moments to, to take advantage, to victimize others, to exploit others. And God, um, if, if I could pray my heart uh, and I pray what is your heart, I, I pray that you crush them. I pray that they're not allowed to do that, Lord. I pray that you allow righteousness to flourish. I pray that you support those, you strengthen those that would lead according to wisdom, lead according to uh, your grace in this, lead according to um, compassion and righteousness, Lord. Uh, I just, just pray your hand upon them. God, we, we lift you up um, knowing that you you, you are the one that holds the universe in the palm of your hand, that nothing happens that is not ordained by you, that is not approved by you, uh, that is not governed by you, Lord. Uh, and we trust you to work out that which is good. God, we pray this knowing you're a God who hears and moves. And as we learned last week, or as we were reassured last week, you're a God who works all things together for good to those who love the Lord, those who are called according to um, your purpose, Lord. And so with that, we, we offer this prayer up in the name of Christ, who makes all of this possible. Amen. So, uh, the book of Numbers, chapter number 11. We're going to be talking about the all-sufficient God tonight. And um, again, one of my favorite stories where uh, some people kind of lost their way in viewing God um, as the sufficient provider that, that he is. Um, you're going to see, I'll go ahead and admit to a, an early mistake now, um, so uh, you, you guys don't get distracted by it later, I guess. Uh, when I had originally made this lesson, uh, for some reason I was just thinking this took place after Numbers 13, and it does not, it takes place before Numbers 13. Uh, so this is before um, the, the spies are sent into the promised land, this is before uh, the great rejection occurs, and before their, their curse is scattered uh, to wander in the wilderness uh, for, for 40 years. Um, 
So uh, these are all the moments leading up to that. Israel has been delivered out of Egypt. Israel, um, God is, is marching them. He's delivering uh, his law unto them. He's giving them instruction on how he ought to be worshipped, how he, he will be glorified. He's making the, the promises of the blessing and the curses that will come upon them if they're obedient, right? And they're on their way to the promised land, and they're on their way to receive. But I just want to go ahead and get that out of the way because you'll see a little bit of uh, incongruity in the slideshow here, and I uh, apologize for that, um, but uh, we, we did get it straightened out. Uh, with that in mind, we're going to be in the book of Numbers, chapter number 11, right? Numbers, chapter number 11, uh, starting in verse number 5, and um, we're going to get into, jump right into the middle of a scene that is pretty common throughout the book of Numbers. We find the children of Israel complaining about something, right? And uh, I would dare say that if you um, were to, you know, flip through your Bible and pick any period in which uh, the time leading up to the promised land or the time where the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness, if you were to just flip to a random story, uh, chances are pretty good that you would find the children of Israel complaining, right? Uh, that was a, a common motif, a common uh, trope of uh, the, the character of Israel uh, back then. And so we find them complaining, and what do we find them complaining about this time? Starting in verse number five, it says, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. Remember the cucumbers on oh, the melon? the leeks and the onions oh, and the garlic remember the garlic but now our soul is dried away and there's nothing at all besides this this manna before our eyes this uh, literally the word means like a what or a nothing right uh, you know this this nothing that that we have here um, it says and the, the manna was as coriander seed and the color thereof was the color of um, delium and the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills and, or beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp and night, the manna fell upon it. So here the people of uh, Israel are complaining. They're saying, remember, remember all the good restaurants that we had back in Egypt, right? Remember all, all the food that we had? And if I can be honest a little bit, I can, I can sympathize a little bit here. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, garlic is one of the best things that God has made uh, on this earth, right? We put an extra helping of garlic. Uh, we always kind of joke, uh, if a recipe, a recipe that calls for one clove, for every one clove of garlic, really you should be putting three cloves of garlic in, right? Uh, so that, that, that's about the, the shorthand that we have at the Blankenship household. So if you ever come and eat Italian at our house, know, know what you're in for here. And so they're complaining, remember, remember all of this food that we had, the cucumbers and melons, and now all we have is this bread that God literally makes rain from the sky, and that's just not good enough for them, right? God is pouring this out upon them, um, you know, completely free. They didn't have to go and plant. They didn't have to wait. They didn't have to harvest. Uh, they didn't have to, you know, hope that this year was going to be a good year, uh, that the rain would come when the rain was supposed to come, and that the sun would come when the sun was supposed to come, and that if everything worked out just right, that they would have a good crop that would be able to provide. They didn't have to worry about any of that. Literally, God was pouring out blessings from heaven. And they said, no, the garlic, though. Remember the garlic. Remember all of the good food. Remember how good that we had it back in Egypt. And of course, verse number 10 says, Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was, greatly kin uh, uh, was kindled greatly. And Moses was also displeased, right? Uh, so apparently this discontentment uh, spread like wildfire throughout the camp to the point where, um, you know, every household, they were not, not only were they upset about it, they were crying about it, right? It says they, they were weeping in their tents over what was going on. Now, guys, I'm, I, I spent my fair share of time in Wachula, Florida. I spent a little bit of time over in Sebring, Florida. Every now and then, have you ever had this conversation? I'm hungry. Well, yeah, me too. Let's go out to eat. Sounds great. Where do you want to go? Well, what about, no, I don't want to go there. We've been there. We had that twice. Well, what about, no, I don't want to go there either. No, well, what about, no, the service. Well, what about, oh, do you know who works there? We can't go there, right? And we just go through and, like, go through the list of restaurants, and we say, well, we're hungry, but really don't want to eat at any of these restaurants, right? Um, I've had that before. 
never broke down in tears over it, right? Uh, never cried over it before. But that's the point that we're, we're at here with the Israelites. And one of the things that we see is, um, like I said, this discontentment can spread like wildfire, right? Uh, you've probably seen this in a group before. Um, once one person voices a complaint, suddenly it becomes permission for everyone to voice a complaint, right? Uh, well, you know, I, I like that church, but uh, just the pews are so uncomfortable. You're right, the pews are uncomfortable. And have you seen the wallpaper? Oh, the wallpaper, can you believe the temperature? It's always too hot, in, right? And just go on down the list. As soon as someone voices a complaint, then it just opens the floodgates for everyone to, to complain, right? TJ, I see the human element here. They focused on what they didn't have, mm. but I'm thinking of what they did have. They had their freedom. Yes, they sir. weren't being beat by the taskmasters. Yeah. And when they left Egypt, uh, the Egyptians were so glad to get rid of them, they gave them all their jewelry and gold and silver. Yep, so yep, yep. They left rich, huh? Yeah, they left rich, and but they forgot all that. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, let's jump into our questions before Jamie gives away any more of my lesson, huh? <laughs> now, um, well, we'll go ahead and uh, get it. And Jamie is, is spot on, right? Um, what, what they were going through in their life here, um, it had a cost to it, and they weren't focusing on the cost at all, right? Um, while complaining over their present condition, the Jews pined for their previous life, um, which cost them nothing, right? Literally, that's what it says. Like, uh, go, um, verse number five, it says, we remember we, the fish we ate in Egypt, that cost nothing, right? Um, so they're saying like, look, sure, God is raining down this bread from heaven and that doesn't cost us anything, but think of all these other things that we had, which also, quote unquote, cost us nothing. And Jamie, like you were saying, what was what was the cost of those fish and those cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlics? What was the true cost of that? Uh, imprisonment. They imprisonment. were slaves. Slavery, right? Um, like you said, they, they were beaten down by the taskmasters. They were um, being whipped and brutalized. They were um, being forced to, to build monuments to the glory of false gods, right? To the glory of the gods of Egypt, to the, the pharaohs of Egypt and all, all this. And so even if they didn't have to pull a dollar out of their pocket to pay for the fr fish that was given to them at night, um, there was a cost there, and the cost was the life that they had to live. They had to live a life of slavery to the Egyptians in order to, to purchase that, right? And at this point, now that they're not in slavery, it's easy to look back and say, well, that, I mean, it didn't cost us anything, right? Now that they have the freedom, it's easy for them to look back. As Christians, you think we ever do the, the, the same thing? What was the cost of our pre-Christ life? Before Christ came into our life, what was the cost of that lifestyle? I remember my daddy's testimony was that he worked on Sundays um, before we started going to church. And he said, everything I fixed on Sunday seemed like it broke on Monday. <laughs> yes, sir, yeah. Um, so there is uh, a certain judgment that goes along with that, right? Um, the cost of living pre-Christ is the cost of, you know, uh, Jesus makes a note to say, like, those who are currently abiding under the wrath of God, like, there, there's judgment that weighs on you even before um, you, you uh, even before the eternal judgment, we shall say, right? Uh, there, there's judgment, there's consequence for that. Uh, what else? What is the cost of living a life without Christ? Still slavery, right? Um, you know, the Romans makes so much mention of the fact that when we are, are saved, we are freed from our sin, right? Uh, we are bought out and purchased out of the slave market unto Christ, right? That's the exact language that Paul uses. And there's a certain slavery or bondage to sin. Um, we are, we're, we're trapped by it, um, no matter where we turn or where we go. And some people think like, oh, well, I, I, I can change my ways, right? Um, you know, you can, uh, you can stop lying or you can stop murdering or you can stop committing adultery. Or you can stop doing any of these things. But I think what people fail to remember, the Bible says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin, right? 
And so no matter, you, you, you clean up all of the lying in your life and the adultery and the, uh, like, uh, go down the list. You clean up all of uh, the, the arrogance that you can see in your life. You clean up your language. You give up uh, drugs or drinking or any of this. You do all of this, but you do it without God. And what have you done? You, you've blasphemed the name of the one that you should be relying upon in everything, right? You've made yourself to be great when we should be depending and glorifying God in that. No matter where you turn, Without Christ, you're turning to a place of sin. And so there's a place of slavery. And there's a place of ultimate consequence for that, right? Jamie. TJ, I know um, people in our church, testimony of uh, what their life was like before Christ. And, you know, it was every weekend going out and partying and usually getting drunk and getting locked up in jail and having to get bailed out of jail. I remember in uh, Peru... Carlos Angula area he went to and started a church there and they had fights and, and killings in the streets, uh, dirt, and today there's paved streets and um, uh, it just, the gospel changed the life of those, those people before they were saved, changed the whole community there. Yes, sir. Yeah, and there's, um, you know, so many people that we can lift up and say like, uh, that will give testimony of, of their life before Christ and the, the bondage that, that, it, that it was, right? Um, so going on from that, right, um, said uh, the Jews were limited in their current diet because they were being led through the desert, right? Uh, they didn't have a place uh, to, to set up shop, right? They, they weren't setting up their own uh, farms. They weren't tending to themselves. So they were being led through a time where they were necessarily dependent on God, right? Uh, this uh, harkens back to Psalm 23 and, you know, yea, though I walk through the shadow of death, right? The valley of the shadow of death. Uh, they're going through a circumstance where um, the, the only provision is the shepherd, right? Uh, the only provision is, is Christ. And what were the circumstances that, that led up to this, right? How did Israel wind up in the desert? Does it start with lack of faith? Because that, that's originally what I had, right? Um, and eventually it does become lack of faith. Um, well, and, and even now, we, we get into Numbers 13, and we have the famous story of the spies with Joshua um, going in and Israel being um, unwilling to go in and take the promised land, right? But there's an interim period where they're coming out of Egypt, and they're going to, um, they're, they're going to the promised land. How do they get there? Uh, Lord miraculously opened the Red Sea. They went to Mount Sinai, spent about 40 days there. Mm -hmm. for, right. And so, and I think we miss the magnitude sometimes, uh, TJ, of what the Lord's providing. There was over 2 million people. Mm -hmm. How do you feed 2 million people? Yes, sir. In the middle of a desert. Yes, with, sir. Without time to plant and that sort of thing. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so the, the lead up to this was 10 plagues of deliverance, right? Um, miracles of deliverance, I guess, depending on the, uh, the side you're on. But yeah, 10 plagues of deliverance in Egypt um, culminated or climaxing in the parting of the Red Sea and the demolishing of the armies that would pursue them, right? Being led out to, you know, Mount Sinai where God handwrites his law upon tablets and delivers it down to them, right? Um, we have, um, uh, you know, this miraculous leadership uh, through Moses, right? Uh, we have uh, the, the glory of God going about the camp uh, everywhere that they go. So God is again and again uh, showing up uh, explosively, right? Um, and it, it's kind of curious, right? I think we kind of think about these times and we think like, oh, that's just how God always operated in the Old Testament. But if you look at the majority of the Old Testament history, we, we don't see God doing that all the time. We don't always see God doing these, these big, explosive, over-the-top miracles. We, we actually see that very few times throughout the scripture. It's just those are the times that People write books about that at that moment, right? Uh, God inspires that. Uh, so God is really uh, showing up and showing out here and showing his hand of favor upon uh, the, these Israelites. Jamie. TJ, did, the, did it get, the, was the miraculous, did it become just normal to them? It, it, exactly. That, that's what we're getting into, right? It, it, they are so, by this point, they are so accustomed to the deliverance of God. Right? And I say by this point as though this has been happening for 400 years, but it hasn't, right? Like th this is just a short period after Moses shows up and, and, and starts doing this. But already they are 
are so accustomed to this point um, uh, that, that um, they're, they're complaining about it. Uh, I'm always reminded of um, a certain bit from uh, a comedian. Can't recommend his, his stuff uh, just in way of uh, language, but he makes a very insightful point. He just tells a story of a time where he was uh, flying on an airplane and how everyone complains about flying, right? And it's like, oh, it's so miserable. You have to get there so early, right? And you have to go through security, and it's just like this big thing. And then, like, the seats are uncomfortable, and it's like, yeah, but then what happened next, right? Did you, did you get to sit in the magical steel bird and experience the miracle of flight, right? Like humans, you are sitting on a seat in the sky right? How are our minds not constantly blown by, by this amazing thing that's going on? And it goes on to tell the story of like, this is one of the first times that they started having Wi-Fi on planes. Uh, and even that is just astounding, right? Like, I, I, I don't, the internet is already magical to me. I can't tell you how they put internet in planes in the sky and make it all work, right? Um, and instead, like, they make the announcement, oh, you know, if you want to log on to the Wi-Fi, here's the code that you need to do. Everyone can do it from their seats. And then about 10 minutes later, they come on and they say, oh, I'm sorry, we're experiencing interruptions. So the guy next to him goes, this is garbage, right? Oh, how quickly you feel entitled to something that you only learned existed 10 minutes ago, right? And that's exactly what we see the Israelites going through, right? They, 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 they feel comfortable in God's provision, they feel secure enough in God's provision that, that they can complain about God's provision, right? This leads us into this question. Um, though we are not exactly uh, sure what manna is. We know it apparently has this appearance of a seed. We know uh, apparently it can be made into bread of some sort, but it's not like we can point to it and say, this is, this is manna, right? This is, um, we, we don't know for sure. It's apparently enough to provide for them sufficiently. Um, not only through this time, but throughout the 40 years that they wander in the wilderness, right? Like God provides this for them. Go ahead, Jimmy. What New Testament writer said, said that men did eat angels' food? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't, was, was that Hebrews? I want to say Hebrews. If it's Hebrews, then like, you know, we, maybe Paul. <laughs> I'm not going to get too dogmatic about that there. Um, I, I, I like to think that it's Paul, but yeah, um, but yeah, we, 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 we see it in, in the book. Yeah. That they, um, it says they, they're eating angels food, uh, here, right? Um, so, uh, they are being provided for and completely sustained, not only for this period, but we're going to see this is enough to sustain them for a generation, right? Uh, of God's provision for them. What about us? How does God provide for us? on a daily basis, right? How does God prove his sufficiency to us on a daily basis? Well, he causes the, for bread, for the grain to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and he blesses farmers that they can get it harvested. And you know, I think about the cattle that we raise here in Florida. Uh, we sell them, they haul them to Texas and uh, put them on grass and they feed them uh, in a feedlot. And then I would be a processor, butcher them, and then they haul the beef halves back down here to Win Dixie. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, we still pray, God, give us this day our daily bread, don't, us, uh, don't we, right? Uh, if we are praying as the Lord taught us to pray, then we're still praying for this daily sufficiency and this daily provision. Uh, and I think now is an even, um, it, it's a good time that, that makes us very clear. Uh, I, I pray, I hope the next time in your Walmart, uh, you're in Walmart, do everything you can to thank the people that are, welcome, are, are, are working there, right? I think it's so easy, um, we, uh, we can get into the habit of saying, ah, oh, these minimum wage workers, right? But how, how essential are they uh, to us, right? To remember, like, um, when we pray, God, deliver us this day our daily bread, this is how God does it, right? Like through that process, Jamie said, and uh, express that appreciation to them. Jamie. We're experiencing, uh, and Lorraine can give you stories about shopping in a grocery store in, in San Jose, Costa Rica, went down on a mission trip. And this is kind of what people in third world countries experience every day, really, is what kind of what we're going with, the empty shelves and, and uh, the lack of, of things, the inventory. I um, went to Walmart last Friday, I think it was, and uh, I was going through, and um, 
honestly, like you mentioned the empty shelves, the only empty shelf that we've ever had at the, our Walmart in, in uh, Avon Park has been the toilet paper one. Um, like, it's never restocked. Uh, but other than that, uh, everything, like, there's always been stuff there. We, we've, um, you know, every now and then I've seen, like, the, the meat ones uh, flooded, but it just means, you know, we buy ribs, we buy, there's a, there's a bunch of Seventh-day Adventists in Avon Park, so we never have to worry about there being enough bacon. We never have to worry about there being enough shrimp. Like, uh, there's always plenty of that to go around. Um, yeah, uh, we, we, we're, even in this, we're so richly provided for, right? Um, God, God delivers. How does God provide for us on a daily basis? I was just looking at some of the things. Um, one of the things, I'm, so God provides peace for us, right? Uh, whatever goes on on the outside, we don't have to worry about our internal security. We don't have to worry about our spiritual security. Uh, we don't have to worry about, you know, I, I, I'll be honest, as frustrated as I get at the government, as frustrated as I get at different officials, uh, I never lose sleep over it, right? Uh, I, know, I know who they're all accountable to, right? I, I know who their boss is, um, and I, 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 I can rest in that. Uh, I think you, I, I'm thankful for the wisdom that God gives us, right? Uh, that I can go into his word, and that I can find um, answers to really anything that I've struggled with in my life. Anytime that I've had uh, a question, anytime I've not known what to do in my uh, uh, relationship, what to do with my finances, what to do with my life choices, what to do um, in, in uh, my interactions with other people, I found God's word to be sufficient for that. Jamie. TJ, I've uh, felt a special need to pray for our president and former presidents. I, I feel like as a Christian, I'm obligated to pray for my president, whether I voted for him or not or agree with him or not, there's an obligation to pray for him. And we've talked about this. Uh, demons and Satan are not omnipresent like the Holy Spirit. And so Satan can't be here. And so he reserves himself for the world leaders. And so our president right now is, I think, personally visited and tempted by Satan himself. Uh, as well as the other leader, he, you know, he does have that ability. So that that gives me an extra dimension or, or uh, um, awareness that he needs our prayers. Amen. Yeah, we 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 lift them up, and it's another thing. Like we we can be grateful that that we have a God that hears. Right. One of the ways that God provides for me. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know. You've done this before. Um, I I can honestly say I probably don't devote myself to constant prayer as much as I should. I feel like we, I'll, I'll say that to some degree, um, but I know like just in general, I'm not a very conversational person. Um, that's just the, the nature of my, my personality and it's something that I, I constantly deal with. Um, but even saying that, I can tell you there's been times where I just go to God and just, God, I just, I just need to talk, right? And just pour out my heart unto God. And walk away from that feeling better, knowing that there's a God that, that hears. Um, there's a God that actively keeps me accountable. I'm grateful for the accountability of God. It's one of the things that I need, right? If I was left to my own devices, right? Um, gosh, uh, I feel like there, there's so many people that are, are posting and saying like, you know, I thought I looked good, but then I had this um, meeting conference and realized like I looked like a hobo. They just drove off the street and threw in front of a webcam, uh, right? Um, and we can kind of let things go in the midst of all this. Uh, and I feel like if I didn't have God in my life, like, that would just be my life all the time, right? We just kind of let things go. But God reigns it in and says, TJ, you, you are going, you're, you're getting too lifted up in your pride. You're letting your anger get the bad, better uh, of you, right? You're not being as disciplined as you should. You're falling into laziness. And I'm grateful for that. It's good for me that God does that um, uh, for me. Uh, thankful for his, uh, the, the, the sense of purpose and belonging that, that God gives me right? Uh, and I lift all this out. Uh, I hope you guys understand this, is, this isn't the, the, the TJ show. I'm not just saying like how great it is my life, but uh, I can talk from the perspective that God has given me, and God has been great to me, and I know God can be great to you uh, as well. Um, I know, I've shared before, I, if you want to know my mistakes, I'll, I'll point out my mistakes to you, but if, if I'm looking back at the major decisions that I've made in my life, who am I going to marry? Where am I going to live? What am I going to do for a living, right? Uh, what am I going to devote um, my, my, my calling and my attention to, right? Um, who am I going to make my friends? All of these, I can, I can say with confidence that all of these major decisions have orbited around who God is. And I can say with equal confidence that I've not regretted any of those. God has been so good 
to lead and direct and provide. And I, I, I promise you, if you will ask anyone who, who's made that commitment, they'll say the same thing. We, we find all throughout the book of, um, all throughout the New Testament, the Old Testament, we find people that were martyred, were put to death, were, were, were torn apart for their faith. And yet they find delight. Gosh, we find stories of martyrs that went to their crosses singing the praises of God. Wow. Jamie. In case somebody say, but TJ, you're a preacher. God called you, so you're supposed to say all that. Mm -hmm. But as a layman, uh, the same thing um, can be said true for laymen. That'll just commit their their life to the Lord. And the Lord opens doors and, and can orchestrate a life better than you ever dreamed. Amen. Amen. And so, like, there, there, is, there is such delight in following the leadership of God. And Israel had forgotten that delight, right, um, very quickly. Um, and, again, we, we have to ask, like, if, if, if it happens to Israel, like, do we get to stand, uh, do we get to sit on our high horse, right? Do we get to stand on our mountaintop and look down at Israel and just talk about how silly and how ridiculous that they are? Or do we use this as a moment of reflection? Um, Nope. Let's go to. Oh, let me go back. Yes, ma'am. We, Jamie and I, were watching the um, First Peter series the other night, and it caused me to examine myself because these people that were under persecution, and yet I thought of the early Christians that you mentioned a minute ago, how they were tortured and tormented, and yet they were faithful even to their death. And um, I was saved when I was 10, and started. that's when I started singing in the church. And so I've been serving the Lord for 56 years, but then at the same time I look back and I think, how faithful have I really been? Mm. You know, in our standards, in, in humanity standards, you know, I think I, could, I would say I've, I've been faithful, mm. but I can't say that I've been constantly faithful. Mm. And um, so it, um, it just made, made me question, you know, all that the Lord has done for me in, in respect to Easter that we just um, went through and studied and, and remembered and it just made me ask myself, you know, after the Lord has done all of this and these early Christians suffered all that they did so that I could have religious freedom, mm. you know, what have I done for him? Sam, mm. so, yeah, there's, there's a great amount of accountability that, that comes to that, right? Um, and so uh, just kind of summarizing the thoughts here. We see the, the Jews, they, they yearn for the pleasures of their old life, but they didn't want to pay the cost of the old way of living, right? Um, even though they said, uh, oh, we miss this and it costs us nothing, right? Uh, how many of them do you think were truly looking uh, to, to jump back into the chains, right? Truly looking to jump back under uh, the taskmaster's whip, you know, truly go looking to go back onto that labor. And if I'm willing to bet, right, um, you know, uh, Vance is a teacher. He's talked about this a little bit. Um, me just going through school and doing a little bit through, through teachers. Uh, there are a lot of people who talk about fighting, right? Uh, there's a lot of like posturing that happens. You get two boys and they're going at each other, right? They're like, hold me back, hold me back, man. Hold me, hold me, hold me back, right? And the whole time that they're, they're backing off that, right? But when it comes, it's just a bunch of talk, right? Uh, and it's good. It's good that it's a bunch of talk. We don't want them actually fighting. But I feel like that's what's, what's going on here uh, with Israel. Um, it's a whole bunch of talk. Uh, but no one wants to go back to paying the cost about it, right? Uh, they want to be able to complain. They, wanna, they, they want the delight of the old pleasures, but they don't want the consequences of the old pleasures. And again, we have to ask, as Christians, do we ever wind up there, right? Do we ever find ourselves desiring pleasures that are outside of, of the will of God or desiring um, uh, to, to try to find satisfaction outside of the will of God? For honest, yeah, we, we do. I mean, uh, you might say, no, TJ, I never do that. Well, then the other question, do you, do you ever sin? Well, well, yeah, I do that. Well, what are you doing? You're desiring pleasures. You're desiring delight outside of, 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 of the will of God, right? Um, and so where does that attitude come from, right? Like why, why do we, 
Because we know it's wrong. We would all look at it and say, well, obviously that's wrong. We would all, we'd all like to say, no, 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 I don't do that. So why do we do that? Where does that come from? What do you think? Well, we get comfortable out there, this comfort zone that we talk mm -hmm. about. We get comfortable in it. And um, when that's happened in my life, um, God usually changes something mm -hmm. and <laughs> puts my world in a tailspin. That's and right. um, it, I resent it. You know, I'm, I'm old enough. I resent change. But um, I've... I keep. I finally come to the conclusion. The only thing that that doesn't change is the fact things are going to change, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's a way God has of of um, you know keeping us in reality, of uh, waking us up out of that comfort zone that we're in. Yeah, I think you're exactly right, Jamie. I, um, if if I'm honest, right, um, looking at Israel, looking at my own personal life, and even to the extent that I can, looking at the life of others, I honestly think like. Those, those times where we start looking into sin is the times where we get so comfortable in the grace of God, right, that, that we, we almost forget about it, right? Um, Israel was so provided for by God that in their minds, it didn't cost them anything to say, hey, we, we want all this stuff that we, we don't have, but they didn't have to pay the cost for it. When we get in desperate situations, where's the first place we usually go? When you're desperate, we usually turn to God, right? When we're in situations where suddenly it is very real, suddenly there are, are very real consequences, or suddenly there's just, um, like we talked about last week, um, uh, calamities, there's disasters in our life that are bigger than us, and we don't know what's going on. Usually those are the things that turn us to God the quickest, right? It, it's in our comfort. It's when we kind of just get accustomed uh, to the grace of God in our life that we start to think maybe maybe the grass was greener on the other side of the fence, right? Maybe it was better back there. But again, how many of us want to pay that cost? Anyone just looking to, to you know, if, if you could give up your salvation today in order to go back and experience the pleasure of sin for a season, would you do it? None of us would say no to that, right? But we still find ourselves doing it. We still, you know, not giving up our salvation, but we still find us uh, going to taste the pleasure of sin for a season. Jamie. I've heard it said, and I've thought about a T-shirt, that the saying, you know, these T-shirts have the sayings, no test, no testimony. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we, we, we hate to admit it, but, like, that, that is where often God does the most work in shaping us is when it is in, in our struggles, Right. Um, but it's just because that's where we're naturally most reliant on God. Um, I'll say this, and maybe this is more TJ theology, so uh, if, if I'm wrong here, I'm happy to be wrong here. But it just makes sense to me that if, if in order to get our attention to be submissive, sometimes God has to put us in difficult circumstances, right? I think that if we would just be submissive in the first place, God wouldn't have to put us in so many difficult circumstances, right? If the first time we encountered the word of God and it said, TJ, do this, and I was like, yes, sir, God, I'll be happy to do that. You think God would have to say, okay, let me, uh, you know, tighten the screws on TJ to get him in line? No, because he's already in line, right? He's already where he, he needs to be. Now, I'm not going to say I don't, because I, I, I'm wary to say that. I don't want anyone to walk away saying, you know what, if I'm just obedient to God, everything will go right in my life. Because we know that it's absolutely not the case. We learned about that last week. Sometimes God uses these difficult circumstances not because of sin, not because it needs to adjust our character, but just to put us in the position that we need to be in, right? Um, so I'm not saying that at all, but I am saying there's probably some degree of pain that you could save yourself from just by being obedient in the first place, right? Um, so uh, that, that's my little aside there. I had somebody say to me years ago, I wish I could go back and before I had my children, because now I know the things that I did wrong. I said, yeah, but the things that we didn't do or necessarily didn't do wrong, if we'd done in anything different, we still might not have had, you know, or wouldn't have had perfect turnout because we're not perfect. So even though we know the things that we did do wrong, if we went back, we would do other things wrong. Mm, yes, and <laughs> And um, so 
Um, and I just lost my train of thought. I forgot where I was going with that. Uh, but I was going to say, Farrell Judah said that when we leave church, when we're able to come to the church, mm -hmm. and when we go out those doors, we're entering the mission field. Yes, ma'am. And, and um, I just read a report from Devin and Naraya um, today, and Devin took a, a group to um, Kenya a few weeks ago, just before the coronavirus mm -hmm. breakout, and... and um, he got back, and then they took that same group to Indiana to do some mission work in, in a rural area there, a uh, poor area, because they wanted to see, wanted the students to see that you don't have to go to Africa to find people that need the Lord. Amen. And um, so it, it, was, um, it, it was a really good report. I, I appreciated it. Um, what Devin and Mariah do and Amen. with the young people that they train. Yes, but it's true. We, you know, we get comfortable where we are. And I think sometimes we just, well, right now, you know, we don't have to go to work. Nobody has to go to work <laughs> except those in the grocery store and the doctors and the nurses and the people that have to be there for us. Mm. Um, but we can get comfortable in that if we're not careful. Jimmy. You've heard me say this verse before. Proverbs 22, 3 says, A prudent or wise man foresees the evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. And my life's goal is to attain the, the first part of that, to, to have the discernment, to be able to look down the road and, and you know, see what's coming. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that can make you uncomfortable, mm -hmm. you know, to, but... I think we always need to be aware. And a lot of people that aren't going to work, like Lorraine said, they're not getting paid right now either. So uh, that, that's an uncomfortable situation for a lot of people in our country today and in the world, really. Yes, sir. Okay, let's, let's continue on and see, um, see how the Lord responded here um, to, to, their, to Israel's complaining it says, and there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side and as it were a day's journey on the, on the other side, round about the camp and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth, right? Um, this storm comes in and it blows over the camp and literally like for a day's walk um, on the north side of the camp to a day's walk on the south side of the camp. It just rained quails from the sky, right? They were surrounded with all of this meat. And so it's though God saying like, okay, is this what you want, right? And he's pouring all of this out upon them. Verse 32, it says, And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day, and they gathered quails, and he that gathered the least gathered ten homers, and they spread them all about for themselves round about camp. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, Ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people. And the Lord smote the people with a very great, great plague. And he called the name of that place uh, Kibroth Hatava, because, the, because there they buried the people that lusted. And the people journeyed from uh, Kibroth Hatava unto Hazaroth and abode at Hazaroth. And so um, at first it looks like uh, it's almost like the, the children of Israel are getting what they want, right? Uh, they see all these quails and they're like, our prayers have been answered, right? Finally, this meat that, that we're, want, that we're um, desiring. Uh, and it's almost kind of strange, right? They're going out, they're collecting all this, and it comes almost the same way that the manna does. But it says, while the flesh was yet in their teeth, while they were eating it, right, that God came and smote them. So how did God, um, how did God, if you had to, to you know, think about, how, how did God feel about all of this, you think? How did God choose who to smite and who not to smite? So there <laughs> evidently were some survivors. <laughs> yes, sir, right? Uh, they weren't all gone. And I, I always ask that, right? Like how many of them went out? Um, were there some that did it? Uh, they said, no, 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 this is, this is a trap. Like we, we know that this isn't uh, what we ought to be doing. Or maybe some that were afraid or maybe God just, um, you know, he decided to spare some um, because his hand was promised for it. But ultimately, like what, what does the passage says? It says the wrath of the Lord was kindled against these people, right? Uh, these lost heathen nation of people, right? 
No, his children, right? The children of Israel. It was no matter what God did for them, they weren't happy. Mm -hmm. They weren't satisfied with whatever they got. Mm -hmm. he, he would give them water when they were thirsty. And the first minute that they run out of water and there's no water in sight, rather than remembering, you know, we asked before and God gave us water. But they just start to complain again. Mm -hmm. You know, Lord, yeah, you gave us water yesterday, but where is it today? Mm -hmm. And so they just, they, God couldn't make them happy. That's right, Jamie. DJ, I'm wondering how we could use this as an example to thank God for the prayers that he doesn't answer. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, yeah. Uh, I mean, and in, in some ways, like, the prayers that it looks like God is answering isn't always, isn't always a yes, right? Like, um, you know, we, we, we look at this, right, and... We're, I'm almost tempted to ask, like, is, what's wrong with this? Like, what, what's wrong with wanting to eat a melon? What's wrong with wanting to eat a garlic? What's wrong with missing onions or anything like that? And there, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. In the same way, there's, there's nothing wrong. Like, you know, uh, I'm not a big car guy, but I see a nice car. I'm like, man, I wonder what it would be like to have that car. I wonder what it would be like to drive that. Uh, I look at my bank account, and I wouldn't say that, like, I'm a, um, a greedy miser or anything, but I've definitely looked at my, my, man, I wish there was an extra zero at the end of that bank account. That would just make a lot of things better, right? Um, and we, all, we, we look at ourselves in the mirror and say, you know, I wish this was different. Or I wish this was changed about us. And we, is, is there anything wrong with any of that? Not necessarily, right? It's, it's not an issue um, to want different things. The issue is, are, do we find satisfaction in what God has given us and what God has called us to, right? Um, submission only exists where there is difference, right? Right? Um, if, if, if there was always agreement, then it, it's not submission, right? It, it, it's not one putting themselves a, uh, below the other. It's only agreement. Um, submission only exists where there is difference. Um, and we even get to see that expressed through Jesus Christ in human form, saying, Father, if there's any other way, nevertheless, thy will be done, right? He exemplifies that, that for us. Um, it, is, it is not wrong to say, Man, I, I, I would certainly love to have a steak right now. I would certainly love something different, right? Um, that, that is not necessarily a problem. But if you let that attitude of desire become a spirit of rebellion, right, that is where it is sinful. And these people, they're just acting on that and celebrating that rebellion that they have against it. And we, we have to kind of ask, like, you know, what, what's the greater offense? Those who are lost acting like they're lost? I mean, certainly there's judgment for that. But what about those who are saved, who've tasted and known that God is good, right? Who've experienced the mercy and the blessings of God. And after having all of that, still turn their back on God and still reject his mercy and provision. Um, that is a tremendous insult. And honestly, like, thank, thank God that it's by his mercy that we have eternal salvation, right? Right? Um, because, God, I, I can't think of a worse thing that we could do than to, after we have experienced the grace of God, to then willfully turn our back on God. How, how, how shameful is that, Jamie? TJ, you probably have listened to the debate between uh, William Lane Craig and um, Keith M. Parsons, the atheist, 1998. I watched Maybe, that the yeah. other night. I've, I've heard, of, uh, heard a few of them. And, right. and he said that uh, uh, the atheist said, you know, if God would cause lightning to strike from heaven and, and do miracles today, you know, um, then we would believe in him. And the children of Israel, you know, God was still spiritual, but he was there in the cloud. I mean, there was a physical presence of God, and still um, they, they, they couldn't let all that um, keep them in uh, path of obedience. They were still disobedience. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, it's, God is not giving us an ineffectual way to spread the gospel. I think sometimes we think like, you know, what, what are we doing? You remember the miracles? Remember the raising of the dead and the laying on hands, right? Remember the speaking in tongues? Remember the Holy Spirit moving in power? Oh, oh, that we had that, right? And we would, we would, but God is not holding back some 
good and wonderful thing from us that we need in order to spread the gospel. He is the all-sufficient God. Like, he's put us in this time and given us what we need to do the work that he's called us to do exactly right now, right? Um, and it doesn't do us, you know, again, uh, have I ever looked back and said, man, I wish that I could lay on hands and heal? Certainly, right? Certainly. But I'm not resentful of God for not giving me the gift to do that or for not calling me to do that. And that's, that's the difference there. Jamie. Or Lorraine, sorry. Carol Walker said, or Judah <laughs> says, if it's going to take you down the road away from him, he's not going to give it to you. Mm, amen. Okay, so we recognize uh, as Israel, uh, so, so do we go sometimes, right? Uh, we, we follow right in their, their footsteps with this. And so we've got to ask, what do we do about it, right? Um, what, what do we do about it? Uh, our, our final questions here. Um, well, I did that one. Uh, when we find ourselves desiring and pursuing pleasures that come outside of God's sphere, that come outside of God's will, what do we do about that? I understand that those aren't um, God's plan for our life, and it's not going to be a good consequence. It's not like that God's going to... Um, catch us coming around the corner and club us over the head with a club. That's not, God doesn't have to judge us. It's mm -hmm. just the natural outcome of not following his will does not turn out well. Yes, sir, right? Um, the, the, conse the consequences of sin is embedded within sin, right? Um, and so sometimes uh, what helps is to just stop and say, look, I know what the outcome of this is going to be. Right? Um, and, and, and use that to stop us. Okay? I, I think that's good. Stop and remind yourself. Like, look, if I do this, what is the consequence of it? Right? Uh, how, uh, what is the judgment that I'm going to be living under um, because of that? Or the discipline that I'm going to be um, living under because of that? that? That's good. What else? How do we, how do we um, when we, as, as Jamie says, right? The wise man sees, uh, what, the trouble coming and he, he turns away from it. Yeah. Foresees the evil coming. When we foresee that evil coming, our, our hearts leading us into evil how do we turn away from it? Well, it's just like when we teach our children to do uh, what's right. We teach them right from wrong. And when we become adults, especially as Christians, uh, we know right from wrong. And, and children either obey their parents out of fear or out of love, out of fear of getting into trouble or out of love because they don't want to disappoint their parents. And so it should be the same with us to God. We should want to obey God and his law and his, his words in, in the Bible and, and obey the way that he's taught us to live because we love him. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, he loved us. I, I think that, that is the heart of the repentance, right? Uh, understanding, like, this is the judgment that we will endure. This is the consequence that we will endure by going through this. And thinking on God and thinking on the cross and reminding ourselves, like, this is what God has done for me. The, the, to, to remind ourselves, right? Um, sometimes I have, I, I, I have to tell this to myself. Uh, we talk about the fact that we are freed from sin, but we're not just set free to our own devices, right? We're not freed unto ourselves, but the Bible says that we are purchased unto Christ. Okay, um, I am the property, and the ownership, uh, or owned by Jesus Christ. And so sometimes uh, it just takes me reminding myself, uh, TJ, you do not have the authority to make this decision in your life, right? Like you, you, you are not the king of your own castle. You're not the king of your own life. And you don't have the right to make this decision with what God has purchased. Um, and so we, we, we are called to repent. And I want to encourage um, as much as you can, repent of the thoughts, not just the actions, right? Don't wait until the actions occur and then repent of that. But as you identify that there are thoughts that are leading you astray, the Bible talks about taking our thoughts captive unto him. Um, and man, man, this is maybe a brutal, uh, maybe this is just like too many war movies when I was a kid. Uh, for me, sometimes I imagine that, like I imagine the thought being arrested and being marched unto Christ and being executed, right? Like that, that's the idea, that's the image that the scripture paints is to march it unto him and, and to have that put to death before him. But that's what we're called to do. 
um, to allow him to have that complete ownership of our life. So as much as we can, repent. And then where we see the triggers for that sin, avoid those. Turn away from those, right? One of the things that I teach my Sunday school class is that you know, growing up, we don't like rules. Well, mm -hmm. even as adults, a lot of times, we don't like rules. Uh, but rules are there to give us freedom because the rules tell us what we are allowed to do and won't get into trouble. Mm -hmm. What we are allowed to do, and that's our freedom. Mm -hmm. So in God's eyes, according to Scripture, we, we have the freedom to do what is right. Mm -hmm. Because God does what is right. And, and that's, I mean, we, there's, there's no farther to look at it than that. That, that we're, we're in the realm, when we're obeying God, we're in the realm of whatever is right. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Jimmy. At men's retreat, <clears throat> something, and Brother Jim voiced this, but I think it was already, been already emphasized. My mind is God's business. And I think about Psalm 23, lead me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, mm -hmm. that verse. But what makes this so difficult a lot of times, I live in the, this hor horizontal, horizontal environment. You know, it, if it's um, working cows or digging soda apples or doing a tax return and so the reality, a lot of our lives, is on this horizontal plane. Mm -hmm. And we forget the real reality is on the vertical plane mm -hmm. with God and, and God in our life. And it's so easy to get distracted with, you know, everything we're involved in and, on, like I say, the horizontal, what we can see. Mm -hmm. and we forget uh, that what's invisible is really uh, the, the, the most, most important. Yes, yes sir. So... Let's wrap this up, right? Uh, let's, let's put this in a hopefully nice little neat package that we can walk away from this from. What do we, what do we learn um, from, from all this? Um, I, I, I think our experience that we're going through is uh, different than what Israel is going through right now. Um, I, I, I don't want anyone walking away from this and say, you know, uh, TJ said that this plague is the judgment of God and this is why, like, I literally just said last week at how I would never do that, right? Um, so uh, that, that, that ain't me. Um, so I'm not saying like uh, that that the trouble that we're going through or experience like I'm 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 not pointing um, a finger of purpose behind any of that right. All I know is that God is accomplishing good out of that. So what then do we do take away from this? Um, we are going through a time where it can be very easy to complain about past comforts, right? And it can be very easy to focus on past comforts. It can be um, you know we have parents getting frustrated with their kids because they don't know how these schools are teaching math anymore, right? They don't know how it works out. Um, and so they're frustrated because they don't feel like that they can teach the way that they want to teach their kids, right? And they feel like, like this has been somebody else's job and now this is thrown on me. I don't feel equipped to it. They're getting frustrated and their kids are getting frustrated. Uh, we have people right now that don't have jobs. And it's not because they're lazy. It's not because um, they just decided they're not going. They don't have jobs because their job left them at the moment. And that, I'm not even going to pretend to know what that circumstance is like right now. Um, we have people that are just experience a lack of creature comfort um, that, that we've, we've had before, right? Um, you know, we have plenty of toilet paper at home, but don't, don't, don't think that I'm not counting the days, right? I'm wondering, how long is this going to last? Lee and I talk, are we, are we going to get a bidet? Like, what, what, I, I mean, we're, we're, it, it is a time where it is very easy for us to look back and say, Man, how good was it back then? And um, I'm going to say, like, uh, I think that I can say this and still be within the realm of, of being biblical in it. I don't think it's necessarily wrong to do that, to go and say, you know what? There were some good things that we had back then. And if I could, if I could just press a button, I would have those things back right away. But the reality is that we can't, right? We can't just press a button and just change things, right? This is the time that God has called us to live in. And in this time, we need to express contentment and reliance on God above all things, right? We can desire and we can want and we can have and we can even express that. And I encourage you, especially to express that to God because he's big enough to take, um, you know, God's complaint box is big enough. He can, he can filter through all of it. He doesn't have a problem. 
Uh, we, we, we can do that. But at the end of all that, let us offer a praise for God. And let us be searching. Let us be diligent to say, God, what are you calling me to do right now? Because I know that this isn't accidental, right? Um, and I know that, like, this isn't just happening because it needs to help somebody else down the road. The Bible says, again, all things to go, uh, working all things together for good for all those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. What is God accomplishing in your life right now? Let's express gratitude to God for that. Let's close in a word of prayer. God, thank you so much um, for, for, for just being the, the great orchestrator, the being the great architect, for being uh, just the grand master over all of this. What you are doing is truly beautiful and truly phenomenal. There are 7 billion plus people on this world. Uh, there's billions more that have, have, have lived and died um, on this earth. God, your sovereignty reigns over every single one of them that has been, that is now, and ever will be. And your promise is that the, the, the experience of every life that is going on on this earth, you're working all things together for good. How amazing is that? God, um, when we go through obstacles, whether it's just what we're going through now, uh, whether uh, we go through challenges, whether they're related to COVID or not, whether there's just uh, work struggles, family struggles, um, financial struggles, relationship struggles, whatever they may be, when we go through uh, challenges and obstacles, Lord, um, we delight in knowing that your hand is on them. God, um, when we are experiencing times of frustration, when we're experiencing uh, what ifs and just uh, desiring things to be different than the way that they are now, um, God, lead us in your will. Um, help us to find comfort knowing that, that you hear us, um, that you answer prayers uh, according to what is good. Um, God, help us to recognize the desires that are callings to step up and to accomplish something and the desires that ultimately need to fade away because they're just clinging on to something that we ultimately never will have. God, give us the wisdom to differentiate between those two. And God, above all of this, deliver your peace into our hearts that we might stand before the world and declare how great our God is. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Sunday school class or their parents that are listening maybe that um, we will start a study on the tabernacle, a study of the tabernacle Sunday morning in my Sunday school class mm -hmm. at 10 o'clock. And also a little birdie told me that today is TJ Blankenship's what? birthday. That's, uh, that's all we call our video group. Say happy birthday to TJ. Thank the Lord. Aww. Happy birthday to you. Amen. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, guys. Um, it, it has been a delight. Uh, <clears throat> once again, I uh, hope that you guys will join us on Sunday morning, uh, 10 a.m. for Miss Lorraine's Facebook class, 11 a.m. for our morning service. Uh, once again, if you are not signed in with Right Now Media, if you need access to that study, you can reach me at youthpastor, all one word, youthpastor dot r h m b c at uh, gmail dot org right yes dot com there we go dot com yeah I got lost in the middle of that when you turn thirty right memory is first thing to go um, but uh, uh, once again thank you guys hope you guys have a wonderful night and uh, look forward to um, chatting with y'all next Wednesday come set your rule and in our hearts again Increase in us we pray Unveil why we're made Come set our hearts ablaze with hope Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit come invade us now We are your church your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. We refuse to waste our lives for your eyes.
Streets and land, set your church. 